Hello, puppies and kittens. Welcome to another episode of Matter of Fact Science. And our guest today is Professor uh, Patricia Churchland. She is a professor of neuroscience and uh, neurophilosophy uh, and uh, the philosophy of mind. Uh, so uh, would it be fair to call you a cognitive scientist? Um, well, I suppose so. It's just that people who do cognitive science are more at the behavioral end of things. And although I know that the behavior is really important to study, I, I really have a great passion for neuroscience and for neurobiology. And so I'm a little more on the neuroscience end of things than on the behavioral end. Okay, so it explained very quickly, what does that mean? Well, it just means that what I'm mainly interested in are the brain mechanisms that allow us to do certain things. For example, to perceive color or to fall asleep. I mean, that's a kind of an astonishing thing that we do every night is we lie kind of still and before very long, we lose consciousness. And then sometimes we do this other funny thing, which is we're not getting stimuli from the outside and the brain makes sure that we don't, but the brain generates all kinds of sensations from the inside and that's dreaming. And that's kind of an amazing thing that it does. So I'm really interested in the nature of sleep and dreaming. And also, of course, how it is that we remember things, how it is that we remember a route through the forest in order to be able to find our way home. Um, and, and I know, of course, that we share these capacities with other animals, with mice, with monkeys, with dogs. And so part of what's really fascinating to me is, is our biological nature and how it makes us uh, what we are. Well, it'll be interesting that what we're talking about today, when we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about consciousness, and we're going to be talking about it in two different contexts, because when we, as you say, when we go to sleep and we lose consciousness, we still obviously have a degree of consciousness. I mean, at, at, at a base biological level, there's a lot of biological organisms that have some perception of their awareness and surroundings. And maybe we should define consciousness next. Would, <laughs> you, have, would you have a go at that? Well, you know, words are funny things. And mostly everyday words don't have precise definitions. I mean, in science, we tum once we know enough, we can try to give a precise definition. For example, of a protein, we can say it's a string of amino acids. But most of our everyday words, including vegetable, don't have precise definitions. So how do we manage to have a semantic so that we can talk to each other in the ways that we do. And the answer seems to be that what we agree about are kind of the core cases. And outside of the core cases, there are cases where, oh, well, we may or may not agree. And then there's fuzzy boundaries. And vegetables a good case in point. Essentially, everybody agrees that a carrot is a vegetable. OK, what about radishes? Well, some people don't consider them vegetables. They're really just a garnish. And then way on the outside in the fuzzy boundaries are things like field mushrooms. So is a chanterelle mushroom a vegetable? Well, most of the time, it really doesn't matter that we can't give a precise definition because we function well enough by virtue of this agreement on the core cases. And I think the same is true of consciousness. So that for example, when I am in deep sleep, you might be snoring next to me and I won't hear it. Or you might be talking next to me and I won't hear it. I also am not aware of tactile sensations when I'm in deep sleep. And we know if we record using electrodes on the outside of the scalp, we know that the brain activity during deep sleep is very different. We call them slow waves uh, that we see. So the brain activity is very different. And then when we begin to dream, the brain activity changes yet again. 
So, so when we're in deep sleep, that's a core case of not being conscious. When a person has suffered a blow to the head and they're in coma, they are not conscious and they may never awake. Uh, sometimes we're not conscious when we are fully awake and we're not anesthetized, but we're not paying attention. So for example, at the moment, and now as soon as I say this, your attention's going to shift, but at the moment, I'm really not aware of the movements of the tongue in my mouth. Oops, I said it, and now I'm aware of it. But while I'm talking to you, I'm not aware of the movement of the tongue in my mouth. And I'm also not aware, unless I draw attention to it, I'm not aware of my eyes blinking, but they do. So there are things of which we're unaware when we're fully awake because of attentional effects, for example, but also because they are things that are handled by the brain in such a way that the brain is kind of doing it automatically. And those have to do with things like digesting and breathing and uh, making um, adjustments in our posture. Those things are all handled by and large. They can all be handled automatically or as one might say, not consciously. And I think these are things that people agree upon. And what's interesting to me about neuroscience is that we can try to find out the difference in the brain when you're aware and when you're not, for example, in the case of attention or in the case of deep sleep or what a brain in coma looks like. And by studying these various phenomena, we can begin to get a feel, but I emphasize a begin, we could begin to get a feel for what's going on in the brain that allows us to ever be conscious of anything. On that, when you mentioned going into general anesthetic, um, yeah. do your tests show that what, what my suspicion is that there's just, it's not just when you're like when you're asleep and you're when you're asleep, you're dreaming and there's you, there's still some recognition of the passage of time. But under general anesthetic, to my experience, there there isn't any of that. I mean, you, you yeah. go under and then the next and then a moment later, it's five hours later and you're in a different room. So. Oh, I think that's quite right. But, you know, I think it's also true when we're in deep sleep, not dreaming sleep, but deep sleep. Um, that we're not aware of anything. We're not aware of the passage of time. We're not aware of our bodies. Um, we're not aware, period, end of story, which is quite fascinating. And, and, and um, many people have tried to address the question of why we sleep at all, why all animals have the, this period where they go to sleep and seem all animals, certainly all mammals, but I think all vertebrates also have this period where they, they uh, are in, as it were, deep sleep, but then they have this period where they seem to generate in from the brain itself, not processing external stimuli, but producing from the brain some kind of interactivity. And this is true even of fruit flies. I just figured that the reason that all other all animals sleep uh, certainly as much as they do is it is that they can't read and they don't have cell phones or video games. <laughs> oh yeah, well there that, there could be some truth to that too. Yeah. So when when you're under general anesthetic, is it the same as being under oh, is, no. as being in deep sleep? Oh no 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 no, okay. it is quite different. Now for a long time, it was really not understood at all how an anesthetic, even a, one of the early anesthetics like ether, <clears throat> excuse me, how it worked. But it's becoming clear that at least some of the inhalant anesthetics work in the following way, that they increase the activity of a subset of neurons. And those are the neurons that inhibit other neurons. So, to a first approximation, there's excitatory neurons and there's inhibitory neurons. And, and some of the anesthetics work by upgrading the activity of the inhibitory neurons, which then turn off 
the excitatory neurons. But it is a profoundly different experience uh, waking up from anesthetic, from waking up from uh, deep sleep. But um, well, the one and, thing there's there's not that groggy period. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, I mean it, it's just like you're you're you were here, and I, I remember going under surgery once upon a time, and I, I remember seeing the anesthetic roll on in that vast tube that they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I remember looking at the doctor, and I was going to tell him that's not working. But it's, <laughs> but it. as soon as I'm I'm ready to say that sentence, I'm in another room, and it's five hours yeah. later. <laughs> it is quite remarkable. I I have a question. Yeah. Are there levels? Are there levels of consciousness? Is it? It's not just conscious, unconscious, like subconscious. Are uh, is and is consciousness not exactly the same thing as alertness and uh, aw being awake? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's a really, really interesting <laughs> question, and. Um, I think one way to address it is, is to look at the difference in brain activity by putting electrodes on the scalp and recording, as it were, the, the, the average activity across many different regions of the brain and to see what's different as you, for example, begin to get drowsy and then begin to fall asleep and then you go into deep sleep. Uh, and we do see really significant differences in, in the amplitude of the brain waves and the frequency of the brain waves as that happens. And so those are kind of different levels of, of awareness. Um, and, and, uh, you know, if if you are tremendously tired, if you have been up for a very, very long period of time, then your level of alertness, whatever exactly that is, I guess it's some aspect of consciousness, your level of alertness goes down. There are, are stimuli that you don't process. There are things that you're not seeing or hearing, you're not responding to. And um, and so eventually, of course, you cannot hold sleep back, and uh, your brain just does require it. Have I lost? I've lost. Uh, the dog started I'm barking sleep. again. I had to hit the mute button. I forgot to do it. <laughs> They lay down to behave, and I forget to unmute. There I, you I, go. Okay. My no incompetence worries. shows again. <laughs> right, so I, what I wanted to ask about was uh, um, I was watching a video where these two protists, uh, and I, I, I protozoans, I want to say. Oh, yeah. Um, um, and they're uh, one of them is engulfed, or I think maybe go, both of them are engulfed by an amoeba. I showed this in a video, and I say, you watch how the, uh, the, the, the protist understands that it's – it's it detected a different chemical environment. It realizes it's in danger. It goes into a fight or flight mode. Now this is an or, this is an organism that's single celled, has no neurons, yeah. has no. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it has it it has nothing by which we could say that it is aware of anything. Yet it clearly is aware because it goes into a panic mode of of trying to escape the inevitable doom once it's surrounded by the amoeba. So and then there, of course there's there's tests that you know famous tests with the slime mold slowly uh, migrating through the maze and then finding the quickest way through the maze. And then once it finds the quickest way through the maze, it retracts all the rest of itself to only concentrate yeah. on that quick way through to the food or to the, to the exit. And do either of these examples qualify as consciousness in your perspective? It's hard to know. I mean, you know, um, your own body can do things without consciousness that are really you know very striking and so it if if all you have for example is a spinal cord your spinal cord will still allow you to do things like walk and maintain uh, and maintain uh posture so when we see a really 
interesting activity. And, and the Kai and what you mentioned is, of course, absolutely stunning. Um, I'm quite prepared to say I just don't know. I mean, what I, I think we can say with some assurance is that each of us is conscious and other organisms that have brains that are very similar to ours, like dogs and monkeys and mice, we can say with some, we can draw an inference and say in all likelihood, they experience something as well. And, and that's also on behavioral data. Again, we can record their brain waves and see that they're rather like ours when we're in deep sleep. They're rather like ours when they dream and so forth. Beyond I, that, I'm just prepared to say, I don't know. I, I don't have know. frequent, I have frequently with seen an arguments. Amoeba, with an, go ahead. No, no, you. Uh, with an amoeba, could it, that simply be a stimulus response? Well, I think probably, I think probably it could be. And, and that's why I brought up the, you know, the, the things that your spinal cord does for you that are stimulus response, except they can even be a little bit more than that in the case of the spinal cord, because it's got a lot of neurons. Um, but your spinal cord doesn't have any con functionality uh, that we associate with consciousness. So yeah, I'm inclined to think that, that in the case of the amoeba and the slime molds, that it's very impressive. It's probably all related to how the chemicals interact with each other. And um, so, I mean, consider even, for example, a fertilized egg developing in the womb. And, and the complexity of that development. It's all essentially uh, done by the genes responding to particular chemicals in a particular environment. There's no consciousness involved, but it's amazingly complex. And if I may say so, it's probably even more complex uh, than the slime mold finding its way through the maze. So, so not everything that it, that that we're in sort of inclined to think. Oh, gee, that's smart. So it must be conscious. I I I tend to just be a little skeptical and hold back a bit. So I'm kind of with you, Lynn, on that. My father uh, had a had a position on animals that he thought they were just autonomic machines mm -hmm. that people have consciousness. And the and he was a hunter. He was an avid hunter. He bragged sure. that he had hunted more meat than he had ever bought in a store. Um, but he he seemed convinced that that if it's not human, then it has no awareness at all. It's sure. just a machine. He says he he's he was skinning something that was clearly still alive, and I asked him, "Doesn't that feel pain?" And he said, "It's just a dumb animal, son. It don't feel nothing." Yeah. And it's it's strange to me that I mean that, that you can look at a dog and think that that doesn't have contact. I mean, the dog the dog clearly <laughs> understands things about you. Oh yeah, yeah. And oh about yeah. Your mood and so forth. And it's not the and dogs are not the only animals to do that. But I mean, it, consciousness. Even if we're talking about the, the higher level of being aware and and analyzing your yeah. environment and everything, obviously people are not the only things that have this ability. That's seems so to me. Um, I, I, I think I think so. And I think because of the similarity in brain structures between be amongst all mammals. I mean, uh, um, we don't have any brain structure that a mouse doesn't have or that a dog doesn't have. We have more neurons. And it's, you know, one of the things that happened in the evolution of the primate brain is scaled up the size of cortex. But, but it's all, you know, we have the same kinds of neurons, the same kinds of neurotransmitters, you know, chemicals that allow neurons to talk to each other. We have, uh, we all have a hippocampus that allows us to remember events and then find our way through a maze uh, or through the woods. 
And um, so I'm kind of with you on that. It's just that once you get way beyond uh, mammals and the mammalian brain to, for example, a fruit fly, and you say, well, you know, the fruit fly does all these really cool things. And don't you think it's conscious? And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. If we can solve the neurobiological mechanisms for consciousness in the mammalian brain, then we might be able to ask, is anything like that mechanism present in a fruit fly brain? Um, and, and the answer might be yes, and it might be no. Don't know. I had I had a question. Maybe uh, is there a way to differentiate levels of consciousness? Like my cat will sometimes like to watch cat videos and try to swat at the cat in the, in the on the screen. But it, it won't, I've seen videos of cats where they don't recognize themselves in a mirror and they'll wipe the other cat in the mirror. And like some, some animals seem to be making a conscious decision to do something, but they're not maybe on that next level of a higher consciousness of being self-aware of themselves, of themselves that they're, uh, they're, a be they're a being. Yeah, and if I could add to that question, we were talking last night about how some dogs and some cats, but seemingly not all of them, will look at a screen, and there's a lot of dogs that will look at a screen and not recognize what they're looking at, whereas others will watch that screen and realize that they're looking at people in a situation. I mean, they're effectively watching a movie and reacting to the movie, but this is not yeah. this is not consistent with all of them. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just, I just want to tack that on to, to clarify my, my, my wife's question right, about levels right. of consciousness and awareness. I don't know. I mean, uh, a different way of thinking about it might be just to say that um, some dogs have capacities that other dogs don't. And, um, you know, uh, Border collies tend to be able to do things that maybe golden retrievers don't or can't. We don't know whether it's because they don't care or whether because they, their cognitive aptitudes are just somewhat different. Um, I tend not to think of that in terms of levels of consciousness so much as um, as, as a part of the cognitive processing of an image and, and say, where an ad, some dogs might process that image on the television to a certain direction uh, and other dogs might not. It doesn't mean that necessarily that there's a difference in intelligence either because it could be a matter of what the dog really cares about and golden retrievers care about different things from what bulldogs care about, for example. So, so I mean, I kind of hold back on that partly because, you know, there's so much that we really don't understand about many aspects of cognition, including memory and including categorization and especially about decision making. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think neuroscience has opened up is uh, the mechanisms of decision making. And there's an awful lot we still don't know, but it's very clear, I think, at this stage that many of the components of a decision never reach the level of consciousness. We're never aware of them. We're aware of some things. Um, but many of the, 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 as it were, the features or the neuronal activity or the neuronal mechanisms that go into making a decision, we're never aware of. We're never even aware that, that they might be there. They are, but we're not aware that they are. Which is kind of, I mean, I think some people find that a bit unnerving, shall we say, um, except that you know, those are, that's the kind of creature that mammals are. And we're mammals and we're like that too. And um, I, you know, we can be the best we can be, 
but we can never be conscious of every aspect of our nervous system. I mean, about what the enteric nervous system in our gut, what's that doing? You're never going to be conscious of that. Or what's going on in your spinal cord? What's it doing right now? No on this uh, on this notion of variance where you know like some dogs will recognize that they're watching like people interacting yeah. on the screen and other dogs will just think that it's just you know moving colors and they don't recognize the, the two-dimensional images as they are i mean I, I see that that kind of disparity in people too where i, mean, I you know, was if, gonna say that yes when, when i'm watching something with another person i mean i will pick up data from that and i'll remember that data and that other person it may no it no has no registry with that. Yeah. Yeah. So what were you going to say yeah. about that? Well, I was going to use a football analogy. So, you know, I, I grew up in Canada, so I can watch a hockey game and, and you know, I get every move. But I, I didn't start watching football until I was well into adulthood. And I know people see things that I can't see at all. Um, they they sort of, and, and this has got to be true of a, of a really great quarterback for example, uh, uh, that they, they are standing there holding the ball and they can see patterns, they can make predictions that, you know, I, I'm just not equipped. So yeah, and it's not necessarily that I'm stupider than the quarterback, it's just that for a particular kind of task, I'm really bad and he's really good. I think we've spent the, 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 the first half hour of this interview just kind of like setting up and we're really not even done with the setup as, <laughs> as, as there's a couple of other definitions yeah. that we still need that my, you know, my wife had uh, had had uh, written out some uh, some definitions she wanted clarifications for. But then there's still some controversies that we need to get to is, of course, why I was interested in talking to you. So, uh, Lalandra, can you get out those uh, last definitions so we can complete the setup to get to the meat of the interview, as it were? Before we leave that, before we leave that topic, uh, I'd like to uh, talk uh, for a second about how uh, uh, what we're talking about is what motivates us to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Is it instinct? Is it is it uh, our gut bacteria releasing serotonin? It, what what's are we aware of it? Are we making a conscious decision? at all times or are, are, are there some things that are going on in our biology that are that are actually driving us to do things so that, that yeah, no it's a wonderful that, question and um you know one of the things that i find so shocking uh is speaking because when i'm sitting here talking to you guys for example I can't possibly make a conscious decision about every word and every sentence and even any thought about what I'm exactly going to say. I can sort of start my, my comment with a, a sort of vague gist of what I'm going to say, but I don't make a conscious decision about how exactly it's going to come out. I can't. If I try to do that, it sounds extremely stilted and weird. It sounds like you know somebody's pulling strings on a puppet. So um, your brain, when you're talking, is going all over the place too. It is. Yeah. It's it your access to memories. You're making connections. Yeah, absolutely. So so it it you know we sometimes I think have a simple version of decision making whereby you know you pose the question and then. Your brain, you, you think, oh, well, I could do it this way or I could do it that way. I consciously decide to do it that way. That maybe happens, oh, come, maybe twice a week. <laughs> the rest of the time we're doing what we're doing now, which is we're actually managing to make sense to each other and to understand each other and to do this very socially complex thing of interacting with each other. But we're not conscious to all uh, we have no conscious access to all that it's very interesting i love it yes it is um okay now we need to do, let's to define for the purposes of the, this discussion what we're talking about when we're talking about the mind mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, I don't think of the mind. To the brain. I yeah. Uh, I think it's just a shorthand way of talking about our mental capacities, our capacity to perceive sounds and sights and smells and touches, our capacity to um, to um, imagine things or to remember things. And uh, those are all mental capacities, at least. But I think that they're all brain capacities as well. I mean, it's just kind of because we have this traditional association of calling them mental, that it, it, it sort of gives rise to the assumption that, oh, the mental must be different from the neurobiological. Well, it's not, it's all, it's all neurobiology. And, uh, and we know too so that- brain uh, equals mind? Well, our mind, mind is, is one of, I mean, I think somebody said something like this once, that the mind is one of the things the brain does because the brain does a whole lot of other things that we don't really think of as mental, like maintaining homeostasis um, and, and, and digesting food. But then so, we, know we, we know there are organisms that do that without a brain. And, and we know they're, they're like octopuses, yeah. for example. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But octopuses, in, just for clarification for the audience, most of their neurons, although octopuses do have a large brain, particularly for a cephalopod, they have a very large brain, but most of their neurons are actually not in their brain. Most of their neurons are in their tentacles and their tentacles can act independently of the brain. So, yeah, I mean, mother nature has been remarkably inventive, shall we say. Um, and, and so there are many, many, many different ways of organizing nervous systems. And cephalopods have one, one way of doing it. Uh, fruit flies have another. Mammals have another. I mean, mammals and birds have something that nothing else has, and that's cortex. Um, so what's, so, what's cortex? Well, it's kind of this large pizza-shaped thing that sits over top of the more ancient structures in the brain stem and the thalamus and the basal ganglia and so forth. Uh, the bits that make sure that you stay alive and that you eat and that, and that regulate things like thirst and lust and hunger and fear and so forth. Um, but we're the only organisms, mammals and birds, that, that have a cortex. So, so there are different ways of solving problems about how to get along in the physical world and different ways of solving problems about how to get along in the social world. Bees get along in the social world in a way that's quite different uh, from how crows and ravens do. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify the one we're... point in the chat about uh, all six um, that you can change different things about the personality if there's damage to the brain. Yeah, so your yeah. point about the mind being a subset maybe of the brain. Yes, we do know that there are some structures that are particularly important. Um, for what you might call uh, personality. And um, the structures that I, I'm going to talk about are uh, cortical, but they're just kind of over the orbits of the eyes where your brain sits. And those, it's called orbital cortex, actually, orbital frontal cortex. And damage to those structures often does result in really significant changes in personality. So that someone who is very thoughtful and reflective and, and self-controlled is apt to lose all that and to become very impulsive, to say very rude things, to be obnoxious. And, um, and neurologists have seen many cases like that where it, uh, for example, through stroke or through um, injury to the orbital frontal cortex, an individual's personality will uh, really change quite dramatically. I'm going to 
throw something out. Somebody sent me an email yesterday trying to challenge my my position by giving, you know, like three premises leading to a, a, a conclusion. And all three of the premises are that somehow, all, really all three of them, although they're phrased completely differently, they're all making the exact same point, that the mind is entirely immaterial, mm-hmm. that, it's, that it's not physical. And, and all three points, phrasing it different ways. I mean, the only one that's of value to note is that one of the uh, consciousness englobes the mind, qualia, in, uh, intellectual activity, imagination, introspection, cognition, memories, awareness, experiencing intentions, blah, 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 blah. He goes on with quite a long list. But all of this, he summarily just decides arbitrarily are immaterial, cannot be physical. Why can't they be physical? Because he said so. And that's it. And that's all. Uh, and so he makes these three points and how physical things can't have a mind and, and a mind can't be physical. And so his conclusion is therefore dualism is true. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I would like to know how you address any of that. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is certainly a not uncommon idea throughout um, the history of philosophy and not uncommon now. But one of the problems with dualism is always being how does spooky stuff interact with brain stuff and 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 we know that there has to be some kind of causal interaction because as i mentioned with the orbital frontal uh damage uh, it changes a person's personality and we know that there are ways that we can, for example, directly stimulate the brain and cause you to see lights, or that there can be damage to other parts of the brain so that you can no longer smell, or you can no longer hear, or you can no longer see. And um, and, and sometimes those changes can be quite transient. Um, So it's kind of interesting, for example, that if somebody imbibes a lot of alcohol, that there are changes in the brain that affects whether or not you can walk straight or whether you can drive a car, whether your speech is slurred. So we know there has to be um, that, that the brain is not just there to kind of keep the skull from collapsing, but that it plays a really important role. And so dualists um, have never really been able to to give an account of how those two things, those two very completely different substances interact. The other problem, I suppose, is that, you know, if, if, if there is such a thing as spooky stuff, it, in order for it to do things like feel happiness or feel fear, it's got to use energy. So there should be some way of detecting the changes in energy level in spooky stuff as a result of changes in feelings of fear. But, but nobody's ever found anything like that. So, so I, I, I sort of understand why it seems attractive. And, and, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there th- things things can seem very puzzling, even when they turn out to be true. And we know that from physics. That uh, I mean, we know that even from Galileo. I mean, it, it still seems, if you look around, it looks like the Earth is stationary and the Sun is moving. Oh gosh! Well, it ain't so. Uh, it's the other way around. So sometimes, how things look to us is not how actually they turn out to be in reality. And I think everybody sort of knows that with regard to many things. I mean, it took people a long, long time to think that invisible things could cause sickness, like the plague or like (laughs) our pandemic. Invisible things make me sick? How could that be possible? But with the development of microscopes and the capacity to do science, to test, take these little microbes, give them to a mouse and give them to a rat and see what happens, we began to realize that 
how things are. It's not always how they seem to be. I've noticed on the, the, the impression that we have, of, like uh, how the sky is, for example, I mean, because it, it, it's, it's common to think that, that we live on a flat planet and that, and that yeah, the sky is kind of, of a dome and that the sun and yeah. the moon are both the same size as each other and that they travel yeah. around us, you yeah. know, that both of them do. But, but it's a funny thing that when you watch video of like the night sky and you speed up the video of the night oh, sky, yeah. <laughs> suddenly when the, when the sky, when the stars are all moving by in unison, much more quickly then you can notice that they're all traveling together yeah and then suddenly you realize that it is us that's spinning it's in the sky traveling that's right <laughs> yeah but you no. wouldn't notice that if they didn't speed up the video yeah. no and it's very tempting i mean i think it's a very natural human thing to think that how things seem is really how they are. And so, you know, astrology was really, your, your astronomical example motivates me here is, you know, astrology was uh, put together on the assumption that the stars that made up, oh, I don't know, the Big Dipper, let's say, really are close together. But of course, they're not. They're not anything like that. Um, it's from just, their own perspective, from each of the stars' perspective, they're not in a constellation at all. Not in a constellation <laughs> at all. But that's kind of a hard thing to accept. And I remember as a child being told that, you know, my father, who was a very practical, if uneducated man, or he was self-educated, let's put it that way. You know, he explained that to me, and I thought, wow, well, that's sure weird. But but there are many, many things like that. And, and I think that, you know, the, we are very um, prone to thinking that what we perceive and what we think is got to be what's true. And it's hard for us to change our minds. And, and that's probably a, an evolutionary bequest as well. I mean, we we're probably built that way, <laughs> which is okay too. You don't want to be wildly changing your mind all the time. So there is a kind of conservativeness, shall we say, about beliefs that, that probably comes as part of, you know, part of our genetic endowment. So when, when we're talking about consciousness, at least when, I, yes. Um, I have a question, like, yeah. if, uh, am I muted? Oh, no. Okay. No? I have a question, like, if there is a dual nature to the mind and, and the, uh, and the brain, like there's something else additional, that's the mind, uh, they, they never have, they never propose a mechanism for how it controls the brain. Yeah. Acts with the brain. So, so uh, whenever we don't understand something like you were talking about the germ theory of disease, uh, we didn't we didn't know there were things that that were microscopic that were causing diseases. But then we found out there's a natural explanation for it. And I think that's what you're driving at. Even if mm. all the all the uh, neuroscience isn't there yet, that likely there it w we may find the answer more answers out there that confirm that yeah. the mind is the is a subset of the brain. Yeah. There's no extra there. There's no spooky stuff going on. It doesn't look like it. I mean, I'm I'm quite prepared to believe that as neuroscience continues, that there will be big surprises. <laughs> there will be, you know, mechanisms that we thought, oh my God, I never it never occurred to me that blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I'm prepared for big surprises, but the, at the moment, the best hypothesis is, is that these mental functions, remembering, dreaming, imagining, seeing, that they really are functions of the physical brain. Um, so that, that brings up a, another question on, I mean, one of the things that I mean is constantly coming up is that there there always has to be a literal ghost in the machine that somehow I, I think that there's a lot of people who view our bodies as being these vehicles 
that yeah. it's like it's it's like in 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 the original in the old movie Men in Black, you know, you know, where they they do an autopsy on this person and they find some little guy, tiny, some tiny little guy living in his head, pulling levers and punching buttons, and that and that's that seems to be what people think is really happening. That at some point there's some there's a man behind the curtain who's doing all of this, and they apply this to like everything. That the reason everything anything ever happens is because there's a man behind the curtain pulling button, you know, pulling levers and punching buttons somewhere. But but it's but there's not an explanation for how is there the little man? How is there the ghost in the machine? What, yeah. what and and if there was this ghost in the machine, then 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 that would mean that you could get out of this vehicle and occupy some other vehicle. And there's a lot of people yeah, who yeah. believe that's true too. Yeah, but, of course. But from everything that I understand about this, which is admittedly, you know, I'm talking to a you know, somebody a philosophy of neuroscience you have vastly more information on this than i do but my understanding of this is that, is that the mind is intractable from the brain that you that there's that there's no way that you can take who you are out of who you are and put it into someone else yeah and and, and likewise if you had to if, if we were to add the capacity for time travel you know it's a great, a great fantasy if i knew <laughs> if i knew then what i know now right yeah, well let's, right. let's imagine that you have the time travel to do that let's take your mind out of your current body and put it in the body when you were younger before you made that wrong decision or whatever back in your past but there's no way even we, even if you had time travel even if we granted that there's no way to take who you are in your current brain and put that into someone else. And I, I know I can already explain why that is, but I'd like to hear you explain why <laughs> that is, if, if you're keen to do that. Well, you can do it with, I, I think the most straightforward way is to think of it like this. When you learn something, for example, when you learn to ride a bike, or, if, or when you learn a, a, a particular poem, and you commit it to memory. There are, you're able to remember it, and you've learned it only because there are very specific changes, growths in neurons. It means that a new connection has been made or a new bit of stuff uh, has sprouted, a little spine on a neuron. And, um, and so we know that Whenever you learn things, you're able to remember them only because there is physical growth in the brain and we can actually see it happen. So, so in a way, uh, when you think, oh, well, I'll just take my memories and take them out of my head and put them in you know, a box or put them in your head, you can't do that without sort of taking the whole brain because your memories are embodied in the very structure of the brain itself, which is why, you know, when people think about um, a dementing disease, for example, and a loved one has gets Alzheimer's and slowly loses memories and capacities over time. And, I have heard people say, well, you know, Joe is still in there. It's just that, you know, he can't express it. But that's actually not true. The neurons themselves have died. They're no longer there, which means that the memories that they held no longer exist. And that's also why when you think about an afterlife, I mean, we all kind of like to think, well, you know, maybe there's something somewhere, you know, and I'll survive this bodily death. But you won't have anything. I mean, you won't have any memories or anything that you ever learned because that's embodied in the brain. And when you die, they die. The brain dies. And all of that stuff, ceases to exist. So it, there isn't anything to survive the brain death. Um, and so although that makes some people unhappy, I think the, the, the kind of good way to look at it is, look, don't defer all of the things you want to do until after you're dead. Do it now. Take care of things now. Tell your parents now that you love them. 
uh, or whatever it happens to be. Make the most of this amazing life that we have because there isn't anything else. Um, and while that would be a great point to conclude on, we're not ready to conclude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This has kind of gone on a long time. A lot of people might be quite bored now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I still have a, 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 a point of contention in that I've seen conflicts between philosophers on whether science can ever explain consciousness. I mean, like, can ever. I mean, there's this guy, David Chalmers, yeah. who uh, he was like a professor of philosophy, and he said that in principle, that there's like a, a rule that science can never explain uh, consciousness. And the reason that he gives for this is, I, I think his the, the premise for his conclusion is completely faulty, which is why his conclusion is faulty. He says that, you know, how that how many neurons do you need before you have consciousness. So he's describing like when you, once you achieve your 10 billionth and 50th neuron, then the light switch goes on and you have consciousness where you didn't have it before. And I think that's, that's unrealistic. I think no. it's like when you. Uh, that's like, a person who knows absolutely no neuroscience, whatever. You know, <laughs> no, it doesn't know anything. I'm glad you put it that way because oh, you're no. in a position to put, say that. No, I want to say that. that very badly, but I'm not in a position to say no, that. No, he knows, he knows no neuroscience. But the other thing that, that I find very troubling about, um, I mean, David and I have talked about this a lot, so uh, I'm not telling you anything that I haven't told him, which I also told him about not knowing any neuroscience, um, is, is that you can't predict what science will and won't discover. How the heck are you going to do that? I had a biology teacher way out in the in the boondocks where I went to school who said that he was a vitalist. He thought that livingness itself was a force, was a non-physical force. I mean, in principle, he said, how could you get livingness itself out of dead molecules? How is that possible? It's not possible. Well, of course, it is possible. You just have to organize the dead molecules in the right kind of way to make mitochondria, to make DNA, to make ribosomes. And suddenly you've got something that can maintain itself, that can duplicate itself and so forth. So, and, and vitalism, as I'm sure you know, was actually very popular in the first part of the 20th century. And, was and they, sounded just, they sounded just like David Chalmers. Uh, the vitalists did. Yeah, so, I, I believed in vitalism once upon a time myself, but I mean, <laughs> so I was hard. a kid. I had no uh, idea. I had no uh, scientific training. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, and so, so what you were saying about you, when, when you make a statement that no one will ever uh, understand this, I mean, I it long. harkens me back to a Darwin quote, my favorite Darwin quote, in fact where he says, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Yeah. It is those who know little and not those who know much yeah. who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. Yeah. Yeah. But he says he says that it's a principle that it can't. And again, oh, he bases this principle. He this principle? He, oh, well, he, again, he bases it on the erroneous assumption that you, you don't have consciousness, zero consciousness at all until you get to that you know, 10 millionth and, and whatever oh, neuron, and then suddenly the light switch comes on, and now you have full consciousness. He doesn't understand that you can have, that it's like a volume knob, that there's degrees of consciousness. Of course. No, he, he really doesn't understand what he's talking about at all. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's embarrassing to, to be quite <laughs> honest. I mean, he's a lovely man. I enjoy his company and I'm happy to have a beer with him and, and, and so forth. Uh, but, but he has no idea. I, I appreciate his hairstyle. I mean, you, you, he has you, made you. his reputation on this crazy idea, and he can't back off. And it, it, it I mean, I actually feel a little bit sorry for him uh, because it, 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 the position just gets sillier and sillier as as time goes on. And, but he is quoted all the time by oh, people who don't want science to be able to understand. Oh, yes, of course. And lots of people don't want science to explain it because they like to think that consciousness is a spark of the divine. And, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know that's okay. I, I mean, it, 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 um, 
it's not a position that I favor. And it's interesting to me that he's basically undeveloped in his position over the last 30 years. He still says the same thing now that he said then. And he doesn't respond to criticism. He doesn't respond to particular uh, arguments about the flaws in, in, in the strategy. But he is a nice guy. And, uh, and yes, he, uh, at one point in his youth, he had quite nice hair. And um, so, sure. <laughs> no, he is a nice guy. Uh, I, I mean, like John Searle was kind of mean-spirited, but David is not. Uh, not at all. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But it, it is frustrating to see how he is quoted, especially by people who just insist yeah. that, the, that the mind has to be this separate aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, by and large, they are people who who really, really have not taken the time to know any neuroscience and to see how the story might might go. I have uh, a friend who suffered a series of of uh, close repetition strokes, uh, mm -hmm. none that none that were enough to kill him. Yeah. But but uh, there was a whole collection of him, like he'd had several in one night, for example, several different strokes in a single evening. And then a few more in a progressive week that, that had happened after that. And it left him in a very debilitated condition where suddenly he, he suddenly he treats English the way I treat Russian, where I have to sit. I have to say the word in, I have to say the sentence in English and then start trying to pick out whether I know the words in Russian to do that. Right. Well, he has to do that with English, the only language wow. he knows because he's in this debilitated condition. And he recovered a bit from that and then went through a series of other strokes that left him kind of like permanently disabled in that way. And so I have a hard time seeing the ghost in the machine that so many other oh, people no. do. I mean, I'm seeing physical damage. Of course. And I'm only seeing physical physical products that, that, that the mind is having to work around the damage that it's done. Whereas if if there was this ghost we wouldn't have, he wouldn't have to be searching for his, the, the, the words to yeah. see whether he know. And he can, he can't speak in numbers at all. I mean, he yeah. can, he can, he can yeah, give yeah. me the numeric equation. If he, he can write out the number and, and say one zero zero nine, but he can't say 1009 for whatever reason. Yeah, right, right. And all of this tells me that if the brain is just completely physical, there's not a supernatural aspect to it. The, the results that, <clears throat> excuse me, had the biggest effect on me were the, the split brain results, which were reported when I was a graduate student. It really kind of sort of set me on a course to study neuroscience because I thought, you know, let me just remind you, you know, so there are two cortical, two hemispheres uh, with cortex on top, and they are connected by a sheet of neurons. And it turned out that there were certain individuals who had intractable epilepsy, meaning that they were constantly having seizures and it was so debilitating they couldn't have a, a normal life. So the, the hypothesis was that if you cut the corpus callosum between the hemispheres, then at least the seizure, if it starts in one, couldn't travel to the other. So this was done on a number of patients. And as you know, when these patients were studied later, it turned out that one hemisphere could know something that the other one didn't, or could see something that the other one didn't. And I thought, dualism is over. If it's the case that, you can, that by splitting the brain, you can split consciousness, there's no room left for for a dualist. Now I was wrong, of course, because David Chalmers then just ignored all that and said, you know, dualism is the way to go. But that's okay too. I mean it's good to have good to have disagreements. You don't want to have too much agreement, otherwise you start assuming things that maybe you shouldn't. So uh, I don't mind the disagreement part. I think that's probably healthy. Uh, professor, we, we have kept you for an hour on I, this. Uh, before Hold on a second, Arne. Okay. Um, a, a lot of people propose that uh, that morality and kind of a subset of that love is is something that is proof that there is something extraordinary 
like unordinary, <laughs> maybe even supernatural about the mind rather than simply just biological. And I know that you've studied this, uh, like you were, I, I was reading something, you were talking about bowls. Do you want to talk about that? Well, you know, I think maybe another time, um, because I think maybe we've kind of gone, gone on for quite a long time, but you're absolutely right. For the last sort of 20 or so years, my interest really has been in social neuroscience and the discoveries in social neuroscience that help us understand the mechanisms whereby bonds and attachments are formed and why they are there, evolutionarily speaking, why humans are so intensely social, but all mammals are social to a significant degree. Humans and dogs uh, are really intensely social. And so are many species of birds. And we do now understand at least significant aspects of the neurobiology to, to explain that. But um, yeah, I, I I wrote about this in, in my last book, which is called Conscience, the Origin of Moral Intuitions. And um, there's still a lot to learn. There's still a lot we don't know, uh, but, but our social nature is definitely rooted in, in our genes. And, uh, and when the, during development in, in utero, as the infant is, is developing, the circuitry for sociality is laid down. It's quite amazing, actually. Well, as I was saying, we, we had kept you for an hour on what was originally promised that we would talk about. We would have you promote your own work for okay. a half hour. And I don't even think that we adequately did that. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I hope that, that you were satisfied that they used Oh, sure. To do sure. No, it's been really great fun, actually. I've enjoyed it enormously. Well, thank you. But we, we did still want, uh, I believe my wife has, has selected some questions from the chat. Do you have? Well, longer? Maybe. Yes. Okay, maybe. Uh, they're, in, they're in the private. What, what, could you read them? Could you read them for? Maybe one question, okay? Uh, okay. He said, "Okay, let me pick one." Uh, um, this. Yeah, I'm looking for one that's a question. We do have some super chats in here. Uh, Majestic Beck, $20. Thank you. He says, due to a heart condition and lack of oxygen in my blood, my body was in a constant struggle and brain not getting enough oxygen. I was a different person, angry and always under attack after surgery. I can see wow. the difference. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Bruce, yeah. Thank Bruce, you indeed. Thank you. Bruce Hobson, uh, Canadian $5. Thank you. Says, do we think AI will lead to breakthroughs in the mind-brain duality or will it become our brain fall, our, our, excuse me, our downfall? Well, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really, really interesting question. And Terry Sanofsky and I have, have written a bit about this, about the, we, we wrote a paper called Blending Experimental and Computational Techniques in Neuroscience. And what's, so, what's really, I think, remarkable is that AI is learning things from neuroscience, and neuroscience can use AI techniques in a variety of ways to teach us about the brain. Um, so I think it's actually very exciting, and, and it's AI is not going to do for the brain what it just did for protein folding, namely sort of basically solve the problem. But because you can get really, really big, difficult pattern recognition problems solved by, by AI, the pattern recognition problems uh, about the brain might be solvable that way. But many things about the brain are not pattern recognition problems. OK. I think that was you asked for one question. That was one question. Okay, yeah, all right. And, and I, I, I appreciate very much your time. We've been trying to get you on here for for quite a while. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm kind of lazy, I think. <laughs> 
All right. Well, if there, if there was anything, uh, I'm going to let you make a closing comment. If there was anything else that you wanted to say, say to promote your work or what or whatever you're interested in, you're welcome to do that. And then uh, once you say thank you very much, then our producer will take us out. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that it's great to have a program like this. I think this is, is really wonderful. Thank you for asking me.